Cowboy. <gasps> Kako and happy Sunday. Happy Sunday, Sarah. Happy Sunday. How's your week been? How's your week been? You know, it's been good. Um, getting some last like work stuff finished because I'm going out to Disney next week. So I'm pretty excited to be in the Cali area. Nice. Yeah, they just had Star Wars celebration uh, out there. So you, you'll be there on a slower week. So it should be a little fun. But then again, like Disneyland is always packed. So as someone who's previously been to Disneyland, who's previously worked for Disney, and I could tell you a few things about going there in the summer, um, pace yourself and then really just like be okay with like only getting five rides in during the summer. That's yeah. That's the biggest uh, part. Last time how many rides i got in yep so uh mm-hmm. get in at opening the easiest way all the kids stuff that's what you should do first like take coco yeah. and go straight for fantasy land and you wait for them to drop the silly thing that ropes everything off and then just head straight into mm-hmm. fantasy land because that's going to be one of fantasy. the places that opens first yeah, here i am already being a disney commercial but i spent you know, spent all my formative youth in there i could tell you all the hacks like yeah number one well, they're planning on going to Disney this year. So, you know, summertime, people go to Disney in the summertime. Not me. Summertime's the dumbest time to go to Disney. <laughs> I, go, <laughs> I go the second week of September on a Tuesday because it's empty. Okay? Oh. Two weeks ooh, after school that's- starts, is that's when you take your kids. That's when you call the school and you go, oh, I'm sorry. We had an appointment that day that's going to last five whole days in California, and we just can't. <laughs> and you just, that's when you run off. That's that's how you, that's how you get them. But no. How many um, days do you really get the good experience? Well, during the summer, the only way to get a good experience is four more days. Because you, four days. It's, it, it'll wow. take you four days to get both parks completely done and all the outside stuff. Because realistically, like, you've got, like, Fantasyland, you can do in an hour and a half if you get there to opening. But here's the problem. Uh-huh. Is the second after lunchtime happens, Fantasyland becomes one of the longest lines in the park. Oh, because four lines. Because for okay. even as outdated most of those rides are and unimpressive to adults are, they have such a deep fan like devotion in them. So like the Peter Pan ride, I- I've never been like ever cared. To, like, like I've been on it hundreds of times and I don't get the fascination. I like I mean, I understand that it's probably one of the better constructed rides out of the fact that it's one of the only ones that actually like flies over the dioramas because you're you're hung from it. above. But, uh, yeah. yeah, anytime after lunch, that line is, like, two hours long. It's the only line in, in Fantasyland that goes past an hour or two. Um, no, I remember. I remember yeah. we were in line for a long time, and I thought, see, and I thought it was totally worth it. I was like, that was, like, the best ride. Oh, my God. Fair enough. Fair so enough. Good. No, to each okay. their own. Everybody's got their own Disneyland experience. Like I'm more of a I'm more of a shows and interactions guy at Disneyland. Like my favorite thing was the there used to be a 3D sound experience at Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, where they would give you these mm-hmm. headphones that went over your head, and it made you feel like you were actually there because of the way that the sound system worked on your head, and so you end Ooh, up. That- No, what's even crazier is that you end up embodying a Civil War soldier who is laying in his bed waiting for triage as he is potentially dying from battle wounds. And Abraham Lincoln comes up to your ear and begs you to live and and talks about, like, the great fate of our country and what's at stake. And he's like, yeah. be your favorite. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's right up your alley. Yeah. It's... That shit is Kavika. <laughs> my favorite one is when Abraham Lincoln whispered in my ear. <laughs> it was. I. You know what? I. You know, and it was running big when I worked there. So uh, during the summer, 
it actually it would still be empty sometimes because people don't you know not all people are into yeah. stuff like that they're like oh let's go on space mountain i don't care about history or like Mika, like i want to go yeah, and you and you know why my my uh, my family was cool with it, it was because it's the best air conditioned roomed in the whole park. Is oh, great moments, Mr. Yeah. Lincoln. Well, oh yeah, like, yes. yeah. Hey, no, and that's the other thing. If you ever just need twenty minutes to get really good air conditioning, your your kids, yeah. you know, might take a nap. But great moments with Mr. Lincoln, always the bomb. Great. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the only other thing that's a, a long line past uh, past uh, Peter Pan is. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and then Dumbo. But, I mean, you get through all the other ones pretty fast. But, yeah, I, I'd say yeah. Uh, if you're going to go into Star Wars land, be prepared to waste half your day just to get one ride. So don't, don't, don't. Fantasy. Like, Maya's coming to her stepsister. So it's like it, we're in fantasy. Oh, fantasy yeah. Fantasy and Disney. Do, do, yeah, do fantasy land. And then is it is it both parks or one park? I think I think we got both parks, but we're probably just gonna be end up being in one though. Yeah, you know, I'd say yeah. You hit Fantasyland, and then you go to you go to California Adventure, and you hit up the the Hollywood area and check out like the Guardians of the Galaxy stuff. There's a lot of like interactive things over there. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I, California Adventure is worth it alone just to walk through. There's a lot of good walk through mm-hmm. stuff there. Uh, there's great places to eat. Uh, and it's also the only park you can drink in because you can't drink in Disneyland, but you can drink in California Adventure. So get yourself a margarita well, while you're there. Yeah. Adventures after dinner. <laughs> yeah. No, there's beer carts out there. Like they have a Carl Strauss oh. beer cart there. Yeah. Oh my God. Awesome. Yep. 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 All right. Okay. So you're going to be gone next week. Um, we're going to let you party. So. Uh, for those of you listening, we'll have Jonathan Millikidzi back on, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to town. We're gonna cover some more of the election deeply. We got some interesting things coming up, um, and then I'm just gonna be That's jealous. More exactly, Sarah's like, I want the election season to be over. I can't really contribute much when it well, comes to the politics. You can. It's just a matter of activating Sarah. Just get angry about something. That's half of politics. Just get angry about something. You got Get something angry. to be angry about? Then I'm sure there's a politician that's got. Something. And I've actually got a few things here that you can commiserate on because we'll be uh, we'll be All talking right. about some things that these are important to bring up to your elected officials. These are, you know, like not many people think about like how much your rent is controlled by good politics. You know, you want cheaper rent? Yeah. Talk to your politician. All right. Well, damn, I want rent. See, there we go. We we found we found we found your. Your gateway into getting All interested right, in politics. I mean, we'll find I somebody mean. else's, but we'll 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 find out everybody else's. All right, so yep. quickly, let's get through it. Uh, hey, always accepting PSAs from nonprofits and organizations on Maui and throughout Hawaii. Submit on our online form in the show notes. Also, political candidates of Hawaii. I hear that some of you are a little scared. Uh, just listen to an episode. Don't worry, it's not that hard. Uh, I won't bite yet, yet. Uh, I say yet because the next the next <laughs> round is a little harder. You got some. Uh, we're gonna have some questions for all y'all to answer. I've got a little survey that's being built up for every office that's being sought after. So there's gonna be specific questions to your office. Uh, no hyperbole, no junk, and uh, you all will also be put on notice that non-answering of a question will be noted in my blog. So uh, detailed interviews coming out at kavikahoke.com soon. Uh, I'll have the whole election coverage section in there and a uh, little playlist for just uh, the episodes of the interviews uh, that's uh, rabbit holes free. So that way you guys can listen to uh, the election unadulterated without my Sunday op head. <laughs> hey, I got to get in at least one day a week where I'm yelling at the world. Uh, also, <laughs> voters, submit your candidate questions. Uh, I've been getting a couple. Uh, now that the line's been open, we got some interesting stuff. I mean, there's a lot of people that are worried about Kauai just because of, you know, that Arthur what? Byrne thing. It's just drugs, drugs in politics over there, you know? You oh. got drugs in politics in Kauai. You got you got illegal oh. gambling on Oahu. You know, we got, like, it's crazy. Oh. Oh. So, like, people don't Tell think me. about how much crime makes its way into politics. And then, we, and then we create this whole boogeyman in politics thing. So we're never, like, really taking care of the crime because the criminals will go oh it's it's 
it's the government. They caused this. They're just fighting us. And then and then they get out of office and we find out that they're, you know, drug dealers and pimps. So, uh, yeah. So, can uh, voters, submit your questions. I'd like to hear more. People are really worried, you know. So, let's let's go ahead and we'll ask the big questions. Um, also, we need to be aware of what's real and what's not and what's going on. You know, in a, in a state where things are stranger than fiction some days... Uh, we also have to be willing to verify what's being told to us. So we'll be talking about a lot of that later today. Uh, mm-hmm. So let's kick it off. Dude, uh, Hana Highway closed down for the next two months. What? Yeah, months? that's right. Uh, nearly at, like at the, at the, just, the, just before the 40-mile marker at the uh, yep. Kukuyola Bridge. It's mm. down. I don't know if you saw the pictures, but yeah, there's. I didn't. Yeah, so I saw some council member posts out there, uh, and some other people that were covering it and did the snapping it. But um, the uh, the bottom of the bridge is actually like s- starting to shift a bit, and so then, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it it doesn't look good. So they're saying it's going to be closed for at least two months. Uh, bridge has been closed. Road closure signs have been posted in Hana, Ulupalakua, and at Kukuyula Bridge. Uh, motorists are advised there is no through traffic from Hana to Kula. So, like, you can't do the wraparound. You can't do the perilous cliffs of doom right now. So you just got to turn your happy ass around when you go to Hana. So you only go in just a little bit of the way there. So you get you get a lot of it in, though. But you know what? Great. Two months. Thank you, Mother Nature, for shutting down that bridge for two months because you just made yeah. that whole end. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and most of the people that are on the closer to the cooler side, I don't think it's going to bother them because why would they? Yeah. They're all going to go cooler side anyways to get there. Yeah. Much easier drive that way. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I feel that, you know, they kind of got like a, a stay of summer on that end of uh, Hana. I bet the people, yeah, people that live in Hunter are like, sweet, we don't have to deal with all them tourists all yep. summer long. We can enjoy our beaches. I only imagine what the world would be like in a day where there's flying cars because then Hana, like, how busy that place would be. Oh, my gosh. I'm kind of glad we don't have flying cars now that I think about it. Five. Like, I like the drive to Hana. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. I love it. And That's, I have to with your friends listening to music little pit stop jumping a waterfall mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh so um a little birdie is talking about uh the uh scope of rent in the next uh, couple months and tweet, uh, tweet. yeah it uh seems to be we're probably gonna see rent double in maui again <gasps> Yeah. Are you how? Oh, how can it even double? How can it get even more expensive? What do you mean? How can it double? So okay. So here, here's the excuse that they're using in Wailuku because Wailuku is about to see like a nearly thousand dollar rent hike. All right. No. There are there are Kapunas losing apartments right now. Okay. No. What? Yeah. So you're we're seeing rent go astronomically through the roof. You were hearing, uh. The real estate companies and the you know like in case in point with the with the apartment complex. So the apartment complex is like, oh well, you know those were abnormally low rates that they were getting. See, we have we have to pay a mortgage, so we're gonna have to charge more. It's like, bro, how much money have you been sitting on up to this point? How much money? Like, if you're really just only charging to keep the lights on, I'd be very fucking surprised because I know on a cost analysis level, like, we should do that on air. I should, you know what? We should go ahead and get the information on all these apartments and houses and then just mm-hmm. do like a little on air exercise of what the cost to do business is. So that way, the layman public can understand how many hundreds or thousands of dollars that these guys make off the back of you inhabiting their space that they have bought off of somebody else who owned it before numbers don't lie no the numbers numbers don't lie that's right there's two things in this world that don't lie numbers and dem hips so (laughs) so we're gonna we're gonna get the numbers together so we can help the public understand because i think that you know yeah let's go down a, a, a a simple little numbers rabbit hole here 
and you can understand how much they charge you, where it goes to, what fees they're paying, how much they pay for the water, all that stuff. And then we're going to break it down on a cost level on what Ooh, they right. make off of you. So then that way you can understand when you look at an apartment complex, are they really paying their bills or have they paid all their bills and they're just making cream off you? Because most mm-hmm. apartment complexes are cream. There's a reason why yeah. people like to graduate it- towards multi uh housing scenarios in in real estate i mean that's why they're trying to freaking put more apartments in wailuku you know Uh and so at this rate the only way that they're going to get the gentrification that they want this is what they're doing in puerto rico right now like so you come in (gasps) you run out yeah dude puerto rico is a shithole when it comes to stuff like this yeah yeah i mean go go check out act 22 (laughs) and understand like how much like there's a essentially a real estate version of the Jobs Act in Puerto Rico, and it encourages real estate developers to move into neighborhoods and swipe shit up. Yeah. Surprise me. It's like they're almost more dystopian, le- yet less dystopian than Maui. It's just like I don't get it sometimes, but I, I feel bad for those guys. They're, they're in a much they're in a much worse scenario than us politically most days, just because like their governor doesn't do anything. They're just for show. And then that's a whole country mm-hmm. of people that get told they get to vote on the United States president. Votes, votes don't even count. That's right. The votes don't even count. Um, hey, that makes as a Puerto Rican, that makes me mad. Yeah. Well, and then it's things like that that make people think that that their votes aren't actually counted either. You know, in the United States, because then they, you know, they mm-hmm. see things like that, and then they're not a part of the process, and then, but you know, that's. That's a whole other voter thing that I want to talk about later on the show today. But uh, let's mm. let's get through uh, the local news first. Um, federal agents have taken down some game rooms on Oahu and Maui. Uh, turns out illegal gambling still going strong. Yeah, gambling oh, okay. rooms, you know, pachinko oh. machines, slot machines, card tables, uh, anything that some crazy uncle can charge time for playing against another man. So, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's it's interesting how game rooms are on the rise again. I'm not entirely surprised, though, because, you know, now they're trying to get more sophisticated on how a game room operates. I I really I don't get the draw, you know, and that's why, like, it's one of those things. I'm not going to support a casino and I'm not going to support legalized gambling because, like, it, it never really does anything. It doesn't like, I mean, I like it in the sense of like, cool, n- you know, natives with casinos, that kind of helps upset the scales and the balance of the thing. But like, just point blank, everybody gamble, like, save that shit for Las Vegas. Yeah, uh, it doesn't seem like it's beneficial to any, well, to the people playing. Yeah, no, and, and it's not because, like, most of these rooms, these guys don't win anything. So, like, anybody yeah. out there is like, oh, you're taking away, like, somebody's business. And it's like, bro, it's not a business if it steals from the community and then it ends up putting in other places. Most of these game rooms, <laughs> their money is going to fly right out of Hawaii and go straight to another country. In a lot of cases, an illegal gambling outfit, that's laundering money for something bigger. So, like, if y'all hate crony politicians being bought, then don't support a gambling room. If y'all hate Mm -hmm. the meth crisis or the gun crisis, don't support a gambling room because they're usually washing their money through those other programs and back into the community through violence and hate. So, uh, you know, even though the gambling room looks like the, the friend of the group that you could hang out with, it, it keeps bad company with all these other trades because mm-hmm. the money's got to go in and out of somewhere. The clients have to show up somewhere. So it's just, you know, gambling. It is dirty money. And it only dirty, gets dirty. and it only gets dirtier the longer it hangs out. So mm-hmm. uh, this is a good thing. And people need to be aware. It's like, bro, you want to gamble? Go to Vegas. All right. Use them air miles or something. I don't care. But, like, we don't need it out here. You know? We don't need it it's not no yeah it's not it's not good for the people it's not good for business it doesn't contribute to anything properly you want to you know lose it something go play video games i mean shit all right so uh moving along from the dystopic nature of gambling um and moving straight into the dystopic nature of well nature uh turns out 14 kids 
uh, three of which from Maui throughout the state of Hawaii, uh, they filed a lawsuit against the Department of Transportation. Why? Uh, well, see, the lawsuit states that the uh, the emissions in Hawaii violate the children's constitutional rights, and it undermines their ability to live healthful lives in Hawaii now and into the future, end quote. Um, the DOT, well, it has not commented on it yet, but I don't know. I'm... I'm digging this like kids don't realize how much change they can make, even not as voters, because there's Uh a certain level to which you have legal rights to interact in public. And so you have the right to go get a lawyer and sue someone as a kid. So good on you. Like these are like some future Greta Thunbergs right here, you know. All right. Yeah, man. Let's just <laughs> actually, you know what? That's the kind of summit we need. Let's see if Greta would come out to Hawaii and talk with these kids, or she probably already has. God only knows. She's, uh, <laughs> you know, she's playing the long game. The long game being they will outlive us so long as we do not uh, blow up this uh, world that we live in. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I recognize when my bread is buttered. I wholly accept my replacements one day. And I think that, like, I think that's half of what holds us back from moving forward when it comes to like politics regime changes is how much like people want things to stay the same and it's like dude i know in 20 years i'm supposed to be handing this off to somebody shit i'd like to in 15 years hand this off to somebody because you know can't let go and do not want to pass the torch exactly and it's like think about this bro like if you do your job right you could retire on time and you could pass that torch. So someone else, it can be their kuleana. Because there's only mm-hmm. so long you can fight the good fight until you just want to, like, put a shotgun in your mouth and end the day. <laughs> like, and I know that's a little graphic to say, but, like, that's, you got to, like, you got to understand, like, like, in the words of the great John Coffey, I'm tired, boss. Dog tired. Like, <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's. It's it's a lot of work to do. So noticing that these kids want to step up to the plate, it, it it's a big thing. We do really need to protect our planet right now. Uh, it's the Anthropocene mm-hmm. epoch, folks. You know, of man's own demise, we shall come right now in this era. And uh, we need to be aware of the effect that we have on the environment around us. Luckily, luckily, Hawaii on both sides, they agree on that. Like, I've noticed that Republicans and Democrats in Hawaii both believe that climate change is real and there needs to be something about it. Well, that's good because, yeah, that don't even believe that it's true, right? Yeah, well, kind of the problem I do notice, though. Like, the world is showing it to us. Yes, yes. And I, and I think that, like, out here you can't escape it. So the Republicans yeah. out here give into it when they're around other Democrats. But I've also noticed when they hang out in their own circles, they don't bring it up. Oh, <gasps> Really? Because it's they're not a good thing. No, it's Please. not that they're embarrassed about it. I think I think that there's a lot of vocal minority. No, I think there's a lot of vocal minority bullying their way in charge of the Republican Party. Like, I feel uh-huh. Democrats can never get anything done because their hive mind is too big, but their hearts aren't big enough for each other. Uh-huh. Whereas the Republican Party is walk tall, carry a big stick, and if you're wrong, just gaslight people until they think you're uh-huh. right. And that's the Uh, Republican Party. Okay, that's my biggest problem with it. And the sad part is, on a Machiavellian level, it's harder to deal with the Democratic Party for me. That's why I I, I tended to stay over on the Republican side. Because at this point, uh, you know, I think if if we were to just play the tango on the Republican Party mm, and by their own methods, then we just have to go in and club them over the head like a baby seal until they get the goddamn point. So, uh, again, Anthe, apologies for the graphic nature of my speech today. <laughs> it got me all new hot now, and I just, I can't, I can't. It's, you know, people are not thinking about each other enough in the outcome of their decisions, and environment is the one part that proves we're all in this together. It's the one thing mm-hmm. we all can change that we all agree should change. So I, I, you know, and I think that that that's really that's that's the smallest hole in our leaky boat. You know, how do you how do you fix all the world's problems? Well, you got to start like it's 
you can't just go to triage and start cutting off limbs. No, like some things it's easier to just let it bleed while you go fix something else. And like, I feel that the environment is like the smallest hole in our leaky boat. And it has Mm -hmm. some of the biggest consequences, both good or bad, if attended or unattended to right now. And so if attended to, Think about how much of the food supply chain we'd get back if we took care of our environment. Mm -hmm. That window is closing on the equator, all right? And that's the ultimate sign of, you know, the next ice age coming is how soon until that that gap is closed on the equator, you know? So this is half the reason why people are escaping to Hawaii because it's going to remain nearly the same as far as, you know, temperature and weather, because we're at the center. So unless the poles shift sideways and we get a new (laughs) north-south, like, unless there's some crazy, like, Twilight Zone level ending where, like, the poles have flipped west-east and that's the new north-south, there's no way we're going to get full-on winter here. We might get a season, which is going to be interesting, mm-hmm. and that'll be the real sign. That, and I'll take that sign from the fact that we had that we had that joint snow cap going on between Haleakala and um, right. and Mount Akea. So, like that that whole like that cosmic event coming, labored by the way that like the nor'easter changes the corridor. You're going to start seeing like folks like we live in an interesting age because there is radar in space. That can show you the map of the winds and everything that's going on. Uh, little wow. challenge, folks. Look at the way that the map has changed for snowfall over the North American continent over the past 25 years. Okay, What you're going to see over time is you're going to see a wave that actually reaches across the entire northern hemisphere. And you're going to see wave patterns reflecting on the southern hemisphere you're gonna end up seeing kind of a little guidebook for how how it flows you know it's there it has its own system to run through and as the ice age comes upon us you're gonna see that little ribbon get thicker and thicker until you see it like so watch that ribbon as that ice ribbon that's that's going over the top of the planet right now because that's our canary in the coal mine that Mm nor'easter gets bigger you know the shift gets bigger you know all that greenhouse gas it all it's just melting snow caps and they're like why is it getting hotter in here because you ding dong it's got to get hot to melt the caps and then we get more snow why because there is now more water in the air than before and then Mm -hmm. that's that's the crazy part is what people don't realize is there's there's gonna be this whole period where they're gonna be like oh look at that we can go straight to the North Pole by boat and not even have to wear a jacket and they'll think it's funny. But then what they don't realize is now we're going to get a hundred times more snowfall, you know? So I'm not a fan of people who think it's, it's cool to be like, Oh yeah, well, you know, the earth had an ice age and we're just going to have one a little sooner. You know, that's the way it goes. It's like, well, you know what? Uh, in, uh, defense of mother earth, uh, good on her for having a way to protect herself. (laughs) Um, but, uh, Like, you guys are screwing shit up. Yeah, you know, so... Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, no. You're real hot. As as the apex evolved creature on this planet, mankind needs to be aware of what it does and how it causes things, whether it's with itself, with its own hive mind, or with nature and the animal kingdom, or, you know, the tides even. There there needs Mm -hmm. to be effort putting into understanding that. I think if we spent more time understanding just how our planet operated, people would probably be smarter than wasting half their day on homework they're never going to use later in their life. Flat Earth Dave thinks of this. (laughs) Oh, I know. And that's, oh, my God. And I've got another bone to pick with him later. But you know what? Uh, One last thing in community news. Um, Somebody tried to float the idea of allowing Queen K Mall to rent out empty establishments as apartments. You can live up in the mall now? No, you can't. You can't. You can't. They stopped Wait, it. What? They stopped it. The council stopped it. So, But someone was presenting it as an idea. Yeah, because they want to try to make money. Well, you know, but, you know, this has happened quite a bit throughout America. There's actually malls that have tried to do this. So this is not, to me, this is no surprise because, like, they tried to do this with the Galleria in Los Angeles. 
never yeah. seen this, but that'd be so weird. Well, yeah, well, it's also like regularly covered in dystopian science fiction. So this this would mm. just be like an advanced version of the company store because nobody nobody rich is gonna want to live in the mall. So you're gonna have people who it would totally be a work live scenario. So like it's it's more like that. Did you ever happen to see the show Sliders? Mm. Mm, Jerry O'Connell, Sliders. Uh, who else was in that? John Rice Davies was in that too. That was pretty good. But anyways, it was a TV show that posited a young grad student had figured out uh, how to pass between multi-dimensional fields going through the multiverse. Like it was one of the like it's OG Rick and Morty for nerdier nerds. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, but there was an episode where they landed on a planet on a, on a version of Earth where everybody lived and worked at the mall. Suggest so like checking it out or anyways. But the thing to understand from it is it's no different than the company store. And it's something that's trying to infect its way across America again that we need to be uh, aware of. You know, those Amazon cities, those are a problem because when your boss owns your house and your water supply, and your food supply, and your job, are you ever going to upset the power structure at work? No. Would you ever stand up for yourself? No. Uh, to live it's with- never. It's never good to live with your boss, okay? that's that's. It, it would just be like medieval. That's it, that's really what it yeah. is. The company store is medieval. Control over. That is way too much control over a person to work for them, um, to live, you know, oh, under them, like, that's they have all control over you then. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. Well, you know what? Enough right. vetching about that. Uh, we should take a little break before we come back to continent oh. and international news. So here's a little ditty from Newsly. Moving forward. <laughs> We live in a fast-paced world where many people are too busy to sit down and read books or news articles. But thanks to Newsly, you can now listen to the news you wish you had the time to read. By utilizing AI technology, a natural human voice reads you the news, helping you grasp the information faster and more efficiently. Newsly provides the latest news updates 24-7, letting you browse articles from topics you choose. It even has podcasts, including ours. And listeners of Rabbit Holes can get their first 30 days of premium for free, allowing you to enjoy an ad-free experience by using the special promo code in our episode description. So download Newsly today for free on iOS and Android or visit www.newsly.me so you can stay updated on the things that matter to you. Moving forward. It's kind of a, uh, it's man, it's, it's like zealot in and like hyperbole season on the mainland with all over the continent, and it's um, it's getting kind of disturbing in this season because I feel that like things are said more during election season because people want attention for things, but then I think also certain things are put under a greater microscope because everybody's like on edge for it because it is election season. But I also think that like people are so cranky and put aside by themselves after being stuck in their houses for two, sometimes three years in some of y'all's cases because of your, you know, the level which you participated in society. So um, I think that like, this is, this is going to be like a matchstick season for, uh, for like, Thoughts and prayers, hopes and promises, all, all like the mind of America. Like this is the sanity year to test America's metal, and we we just proved we could do endurance, but we couldn't do it kindly. So, <laughs> so uh, in the crankier side of news, um, we we've got like it's commencement speech season, and I'm I'm 
interested, like, I, you know, th- there were some articles that I read that about about people, like, using their their graduation ceremonies as, as a platform. And I don't really want to give space to the who's, how's, and why's because those people don't need to be propped up in the media. But, like, I think it, it needs to be said that, like, like I, I put politics in that church and state scenario. So, like, unless it's civics class, like, keep it off the podium, you know? Uh, I feel that if it's the youth commencement speaker, whether you agree or disagree with what they have to say, let them do it. But I think that the um, the faculty needs to be aware of the times that they live in, and they need to be a fine example of both sides. And so whether a dean wants to say something or not, you know, that's that's really based more upon, like, okay, you want to say this? Well, then you should probably turn to the entire student body. Because, like, mm-hmm. it, it, it was terrible what he said, but it was, you know, it was exactly a Wait, sign. what are you? Well, and like I said, I don't want to give too much of a platform to that. And it's it has more to do with the case of listening to each other. And that's why, like, I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to bring up more of a point of, like, how someone could say something that doesn't match with their community's needs. Okay. So this is why I want to detach from the actual statement of like what he said, because this could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the support system. I wholly agree that what he said was stupid and not correct to be said out loud. And it's far beyond the times, but how he got to the conclusion that he could say that out loud and it would be acceptable that I feel is part of the conversation that we need to have from this because there's a lot that is going on, especially in election season, where people are going to to start outrageous speeches, to bring up nonsensical points, to talk in as much hyperbole as possible to get you captivated and motivated but unknowing as to why. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think that the – especially Hawaii – um, one of the biggest things that brought me to wanting to cover the election is the fact that, like, there is way too much of a vocal minority in charge of government, okay? The, it, it, in, and the problem is, is that it's not the boogeyman. You know, there may be some fallible people in charge, but it is literally at the the point of the public not interacting as to why everything is the way it is. I've talked to enough politicians, both on the mic, off the mic, uh, you know, and I will have to say that my consensus from the outside of as someone who like herds cats for a living, I see all these kitties just running around and nothing getting done because it's really it's it's the people's apathy. And I think a lot of that comes from we have a lot of people giving speeches about things, but none of them are talking right about it. None of them are doing good about it. None of them are making a change about it. So, like, right. the thing that I want to take away from this is not only can they be saying what is totally against the tide, okay? This vocal minority that comes out, and, you know, and we're going to start covering it. And then that's the, the reason why I want to have this conversation before we cover these next segments, because it's, to some people, it's going to seem like conspiracy, to some people, they're going to be like, yeah, that makes total sense. And to some people, they're going to completely reject it because that's the world that they live in and you don't want to upset that. And so mm-hmm. it's how do we have a national conversation about the scarier side of the election, the hyperbole that comes with it, the movements that are born, and how some of them can be damaging if people go way too far down that rabbit hole. Because they're unaware yeah. that they're either following someone without any accreditation, without any knowledge of the scenario, or they're so good with their silver tongue that all they do is talk, yet you get nothing of value out yeah. of it. And that's that's I feel like that's a lot. Yeah. That's just talking basically in circles and aren't really making a point but like they're hyping it up so like the energy is super high so you think that they're saying something important but really they're not yep yep yeah um i'm I'm gonna be creating a small like question like ask yourself this question internally every time you hear someone speak thing 
Um, I'm trying to source a lot of materials. Um, I'm trying to think of it from more of a layman's perspective than actually like a, a psychology or cult breaking perspective. Cause like I, I've done a lot of my learning on cult behaviors and I, and I've, you know, interacted with a lot of people who have survived some crazy scenarios, uh, by way of interview or working with an interaction on, you know, other projects, but it's, it's hard now in a day and age of such influence that can be bought and then it's you're automatically tuned in you know so it's like mm -hmm. th there's people don't understand that everything is being sold to them everything everything that they are is being sold to them and there's nothing mm -hmm. that's a part of them anymore that's originally them. And so they, you know, so they want to be a part of these things. So they hear these things and they they think that they're doing good by latching on to something that can make them a hero. So, like, folks, we, we need to be aware as we cover these things that it just keep an open mind and realize that, you know, it's it's worth the conversation to have. And if there's somebody in your household that has been infected by one of these echo chambers or hyperbolistic word salad monsters of the vocal minority. Like, I mean, we really need to be bopping them on the head and tell them to go back into your cave because that's really what it is, is we now have the, 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 like, the people who shouldn't be in charge of society are trying to bully us into being the lessers. And that's where we as, you know, this is where one part we are the 90% in, in the in the thought, you know, in the thought ethos of America, like it's wholly different than what the the financial status of America. America agrees on a brain based level. It can't agree pocket to pocket right now. You know, fuck, we'll get capitalism when we get it. But I find that the national conversation is at such a high yield point right now. And statistics are so readily available in this age that it really seems that America gets along on most of it. They're just getting gaslit by who affords their time in the media or in politics. So if we could start walking away, if someone just starts talking like a fucking supervillain on their stump speech, you need to walk away. So speaking of supervillains and stump speeches, Dr. Oz wins the Pennsylvania's GOP Senate primary after McCormick concedes. So now he's on the ticket. Okay? That means okay. no Dr. Oz is now on the November ticket. Okay? He could be a senator in Pennsylvania. Wow. Could be. Yes. Okay. And so the reason why I bring this one up is that the GOP has been using, the well, the dirtier side of the GOP, because there's quite a few of us that do not believe in this part of the Republican Party being so crazy and trying to upend the natural order of freedom. Instead, they're trying to control things. The crazier part is the people who always say there's a conspiracy are the ones hiding behind a conspiracy. So there was a lot of complaints from Trumpians and all of their bullshit saying that the Pennsylvania election was rigged and it was a race between two Trump-backed candidates. So they had two people fighting over the same base and they're saying the election's rigged. And then one of their candidates wins. Oh, well, of course, one of their candidates wins because they own both of the candidates. So how was, <laughs> again, just like I said before, how can you rig an election when it's already fixed? Okay, folks? Yeah. That's the problem. The fox is in the hen house. We have a huge problem in the GOP, and the foxes are out having a goddamn heyday, and they're trying to manipulate things through affluence and wealth. All right? So you now have Dr. Oz, who in collusion, which at this point, like, he got a seat. They took all the votes they could, and he's got a chance to get this seat. And how many good candidates did they bully out? Two candidates yeah. backed by a real – what the real conspiracy is here is that money-based Republicans and Democrats, and there's evils on both sides, they're carpet-bagging across America, and they're trying to establish footholds in new places to build cities from scratch again. Okay, this is the same thing that happened after the Civil War. This is the same thing that happened after the Great Depression. 
We're seeing cities falling everywhere. So guess what? All the smart people leave because they got to go find smart people jobs. Because if you don't get a smart people job, you're going to be cracking a whip at a woofing farm for freaking 14 hours a day, never getting anything by. So once all the smart people leave your city, you are screwed because then dumber people with money come in and bully their way into office because they can buy their way mm-hmm. in. And then they change things. And so in reflection of that, this is how we get the bad housing scenarios we have. So, folks, be aware that there is a lot going on here. There's a lot at stake here. You need to understand what a carpetbagger is. These are people that invade from another place in the country. You get a guy from Texas. You get someone from Ohio, whatever. And they've literally only been in our state long enough to run for office. Just like Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz has only been a resident of Pennsylvania long enough required by law to run for Senate. Wow. So think about these folks running for Senate. Think about these folks running for city council. If you like to keep Hawaii, Hawaii, look at the voters, where they come from, okay? (laughs) We're going to do a lot of, of question asking so that way people can know where their candidates come from, how they get here, what they're, you know, is, are, are you really, like, this is not a matter of, like, are you Kanaka or not? This is not a matter of Kama Aina or not. This is a matter of with you're within the intent of the community. It's really cool that someone hops on a planet and goes, oh, my God, I'm going to move to a Hawaiian find a spiritual awakening, and I might just save the Aina. Cool. Whatever, Nancy. Uh, you just have fun in your influencer cave, and if you come out, just don't be an asshole. But there's a lot of people that show up and go, ooh, look, peasants, stupid peasants. And then they're like, I could rule over these peasants. And then they run for office. Okay, so that's like, Mm. you guys really need to watch out. So there's, and not all of them are going to say yes to coming out on the show. I realize that I'm getting a lot of soft no's based on the fact that some people just don't want to be asked, what's your job and how does it do, you know? (laughs) Like, why wouldn't you? Exactly. Like, why and that's that's the other thing is, like, I realize there are, there, are some, there are some candidates out there listening go, I check my spam folder, bro. I don't see nothing. Hey, bro, hit me up. Let's do this. All right? If you ain't afraid, come on. You know how I've been treating everybody. I've been equal and kind. There's some people I just want to rip out my hair. You can kind of feel it sometimes through the microphone when I'm trying real hard to be real nice to somebody. Count how many times I say right on. That's that's me blinking my eyes on air. <laughs> say right on if you're under distress. It's the only neutral word I can say. Because if I say too much, it sounds like I'm over-supporting a candidate. If I say too little, then it seems like, you know, so if, I, if I'm if saying right... The rock, I dig it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dig it. <laughs> yeah. Every time I say dig it or right on, take a drink, because that's literally me yeah. wishing I could. Because <laughs> you can't, if you're trying to be a neutral news source, you can't sit there... Yeah, you have, have to just say the same thing to everybody. Exactly. Yep. Right yep. Let's hear your... And if it's bullshit, well, let's hear your good shit if it's good shit. <laughs> exactly. And so and that, that'll be the, the big thing to look at, you know. So you got to be able to discern this, guys, because I can't just, like, let them say it and then, like, spank them on the butt on air. It can't always happen that way. Sometimes I've got to, like, they've got to come out over time. they got to show us. I'm going to let the supervillains monologue, but at the same time I'm going to let, like, all the people that are working hard for you get that same amount of time to get their point across. And then as long as we all read the data together, you know, both on air and off air together, then we can figure it out. Um, so the thing is, is many of the same Republicans who were talking voter fraud about Donald Trump's 2020 loss are the same ones that are pulling the whole like, you know, it it's... It, I think the best way to put it is when right now when Republicans lose elections, the voting is presumed bad or messed up or a suspect, you know. And then when Republicans win, the voting is just like, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I won because it's it's fair now. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. so I think we're getting into a sore loser age in the Republican Party, and that tends to happen when stupid people run for office, because why the hell would I vote for a thoracic surgeon that has spent most of his life trying to sell essential oils to me? That's not a doctor. That's a charlatan. And why would I want a charlatan representing me in the Senate? So people in Pennsylvania, get your shit together. Like, I believe that anybody can be president. Look, we've had a peanut farmer. Look, we had a moron for four years, okay? Mm-hmm. I, I seriously, like, we, we, have, we have let the fox in the hen house so many times. And I think that there's just people need to be aware that, like, being bullied doesn't mean that that person can eventually be right. You need to stand up to the bullies when they, when they drop in this stuff. There has been no data to date. That has proved any of these elections were falsified. There's been a lot of cases where if you folks investigate, and we'll cover some more, um, most cases when Republicans talk tampering, it later turns out the Republicans were tampering. So what I say as a member of the GOP is that, uh, guys, we need to get the cronyism out. We need to stop trying to fix elections. We need to be focused. You know, this whole, like, look at them, but they're doing this, and they're being evil, and then they're not. You know, it's like, why don't you point at them when they're actually doing the wrong thing? You know, Democrats do tons of bad things. They're fucking oligarchs these days. So, like, there's not it's not that hard to point out when a Democrat's being bad because it usually involves money. Okay, whereas in most cases, Republicans try to use the good old boy system to fix everything. So you tend to see more mob relations. You tend to see more union relations, even though they like they want to shut down most of the unions. They don't want to shut down their favorite unions that clean and launder all their money or they get lobbied mm-hmm. from. So like, learn how to see them on both sides. Like right now, the Republican game is gaslight everybody into thinking that like the election was stolen. Which, by the way, by and large, the the continental United States is over this. Like, check the Continental U.S. News. We don't talk about it out there, okay? There have already been proved countless times, again and again, everybody that said that they could audit the election and find something found nothing. And then a lot of cases where investigations were made, it turned out there was a lot of meddling from the Republican Party. So what does that tell me? We fucked up as a party. That tells me we've got corrupt individuals inside of our party, and we need to kick them out. And they're all found in the same damn avenue. They're stuck right there in those Trumpian politics. You have idiot bullies trying to tell you that they know better, and they're completely incapable of operating the system. They have no answers. When you ask them a question and they go into a word salad, you don't get anything. You know, There's quite a few candidates that I'd like to have on air so then that way like we can talk about it again and be able to go that was word salad but there's some candidates that like i i like to be able to get everybody through the first phase and then we're going to go back and we're going to identify those people and go like hey that actually answered a question hey this person never answers a question because this is important to understand because some of you just like you don't psychologically get it until somebody points it out and it's right there in front of us. So there, and there's quite a few governor candidates where I'm like, nope, nope, nope. And I think that's why, like, I'm not going to endorse a certain candidate right now. But I think that's why a certain said candidate is doing so well in polling is because they know what they're talking about. So for those of you watching the governor race, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know you know who we're talking about, but I'm not going to give an endorsement of said candidate on air. Um, but I hope to have them on quite a bit over the next month or two. Um, so going into all that, I like to jog it back and revisit the January 6th commission. Uh, we're going to be putting the link in the show notes regularly when we bring this up. I kind of just want to revisit this for a brief second before we go to break. But um, a lot has happened in the January 6th committee uh, since since the events and has continued to go on. That's something we're actually talking about on the mainland. You know, the continent knows what's going on. Like, I mean, there's 50 other states. There's how many? 300, like 20 million other people. So, like, there's only less than 2 million people out in Hawaii at any given time. So do you really think we know what's going on out on the continent unless we check it in? All right? So anybody who's listening to Stop the Steal shit, you got to understand it's a byproduct of the January 6th thing. 
And so it's a smokescreen. That's your real false flag here is that you have fake politicians bankrolled by the fakest politician who pretended to be president selling a lie, backing patsy candidates to split the vote because they want to try to prove on some level that their big lie, big steal thing is true because if they can, it bails them out of being charged with treason for what they did on January 6th, which they should be tried for treason on that. Because as far as I'm concerned, like, like that was treasonous as hell. Yeah, it was treasonous as hell. So I mean, and there's there's reports now coming out, um, which I'd like to cover in the next couple episodes, and then a book that's going to be coming out this fall. And apparently, data in it states that um, Mike Pence was being like bullied, like threatened, bullied by Trump administration for not stepping in line with what he wanted to do on January sixth. They tried repeatedly to get him to collude with fixing the election because they wanted to sell the idea it was rigged in order to justify why they fixed it. And that's the thing. is is At the end of the day, when you look at the Trump campaign and his loss, he's trying to justify committing a crime by committing another crime. And that's where we need to look inward at our party as Republicans and recognize that that's not how we do business. He needs to take his licks. He wasn't a good president. He wasn't a qualified adult to be had in the room. Like, we have, there's no boogeyman out there. There's a void that he left behind. And that's really what America's fighting right now. People don't pay attention to the cause and effect of who comes into power. And that's why I really think this. This year's election is the biggest one for Hawaii because this is a year that not only policy changes, but there's a lot of appointments and offices that happen. And people don't realize that when a president comes in, they make a lot of appointments. And that's where I feel that, like, as 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 a planner type of person, that Trump failed ho- horrifically is that there was no plan for that. He threw out the old plan. He didn't invite anybody in to play he didn't think about half of the appointments he had to make there were offices that were left empty at times just because he had no foresight to look beyond like the five people in the room with him and then because they had no work ethic or nature of like doing it it was just they were running a skeleton crew on everything and they just laundering money in the white house so we're going to uh, start covering that a little bit more. I think now is the time for the reflection period on that, especially with the election coming up. I think it would really influence the way that people interact with their candidates, especially with Republicans that need to find better candidates because it's really hard right now when most of our candidates are either criminals or idiots. So, uh, yeah, hope to cover that more. And uh, now, as a little brain break, we're going to have a little PSA, and we'll be right back for a little gossip. Moving forward. Did you receive a call or message that mentioned Social Security and demanded immediate action? Did the caller know your Social Security number or other personal information and tell you that your Social Security number had been used in connection with a crime? Did you feel worried that your social security number might be suspended, your bank account might be frozen or seized, or you could be arrested? That is not the Social Security Administration. Social Security will not threaten you, demand your personal information, or instant payment, email or text you pictures or documents, or use a real government official's name to gain your trust. Social Security does not accept payments by gift card, prepaid debit card, internet currency, or by mailing cash. Criminals use these forms of payment because they're hard to trace. Don't be fooled. Hang up. Ignore them. Report this criminal activity to the Social Security Administration Office of the Inspector General at oig.ssa.gov. Moving forward. All right. Let's do this. I'll talk about it once, Sarah. We're going to talk about it once, and then we'll probably not come back to it for a long time, but we're going to talk about it. What are we talking about? Let's hear it. Johnny Depp, Amber Heard. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. That was a shit show. Agreed. Agreed. Um, A major 
fish show. But I mean, it was horrible yet extremely entertaining all at the same time. So the question I'm going to ask you is: Team Depp or Team Heard? Oh, t- Team Depp. But I both. But I think they're both fucked. I mean, I think they're both have some serious issues, and they are both extremely toxic. But in that situation, I think she crossed the line, and he was like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're both shitty, but you took it to a whole new level when you like tried to mess my career up." You know, I think they're both shitty people. I mean, just like hearing the audios of both of them, they seem like they seem like they have some serious issues. I shouldn't say they're shitty people. I shouldn't say that. It seems like they have some major major issues that they need to deal with. They need to go to some therapy. They need some counseling. They need to get off the drugs. Ugh. Yeah, no, they I need to find some... <laughs> They need Jesus. They need Jesus. <laughs> they do. They yeah. need to be saved. Somebody. I don't I don't they... care. Yeah. A weekend at Club Man. I don't know. No, I uh, you know what? Uh you may have scaled back your your analysis on them, but I will say they are shitty people. You know, and I hate it that the media gives attention to shitty people. Like, yeah, like why? Like, why do we? It, it, for like, all of the bad oh that happened, like, that took up so much media, and it was a divorce. Like with all of the things that we could be focusing on, and we're all so just entertained by it too because it's everywhere and it's so dramatic. Like, but literally, it was covered so much. Like. There was things that I think could have been covered that were just more important. Oh yeah, but no, the minute to minute ratings on it. Like I was I was watching a lot of the ratings for news networks during yeah. this. It was the only time that they were yeah, getting so traction. Awesome. Obviously we're all watching the Johnny Depp heard Trial scandal, of the Century. Whatever. Yep. They're like, you are loving this shit. We need to pump it out. So I mean Desperate. we're the ones by watching it, actually told them to keep showing it. So I guess it's kind of to our a degree. fault that for the media. Yeah, but that paradox feeds itself because you got to remember they're only popular yes. because a magazine told you they were popular, and those magazines right. are owned by those organizations. Okay, most people don't yeah. realize how many newspapers Disney owns. Okay. Yeah. Think about this. But they don't own what those two said. And their audio and all that shit because at the end of the day, that's why we were all watching it because it was like, is this a movie? This seems like this is so ridiculous. Like, how can this even be true that, like, these two famous people have this, like, crazy toxic relationship behind closed doors? Well, we're all the same bags of meat, so it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or you're a $5 heir. Like, it doesn't, like, people are people. Like more money, more problems. Yeah. I did my divorce. Nobody was watching my divorce. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, you guys had a. No matter what work. happened in the in the fireworks of it starting, by the end of it, you guys were still civil people, though. So it's like. That's true. That's true. They got so nasty. Ugh, divorce brings out the disgustingness of everybody. Like, ugh, the worst. But what do you think? Are you team Depp or are you team Hurt? I already feel like I know what you're gonna say. I'm team humankind, and I think that they should not be on television. I think that that was a gross misuse of a ratings grab for most news stations. I think we mm-hmm. had, like, the gun debate was in the middle of all of that. Oh, nobody exactly. wants to talk about guns. Here's Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Like, that's yeah. that's the news's fault right there, okay? Like, we, we have a huge problem about calling out facts as fake news right now. Let's get away from that. But the point I really want to make on this, okay, is that it's the wag. It's not about, like, the news doesn't have to feed you anything fake. Because the truth is far weirder than anything else you will experience in your life. So let's try to get Mm -hmm. away from that. Because a very good amount of the time, people are trying to feed you the real data because they want the real end result. So, like, most news, even if bought outside of Fox, which is just an opinion hole of junk... Um, it's, it's, it's all hyperbole, so I don't count it as real news. Like I, I'm the first Republican to admit that Fox news doesn't ever say anything worthwhile because they don't say anything. It's just people talking in a circle about the same problem that they had last week, just dressed up in a new moo moo. Yeah. So, um, but like your generic, like 
local news covering this whole Depp and Heard trial thing. I just like I think it's a waste of the public consciousness. Like, yeah, it's election season. It's I mean it's fucking shooting season. You know I mean damn every day every day this week we're back to the same numbers that we were in 2018 before everything started. Like, the last major <laughs> reporting period before COVID, we're at the same, like, and that was the thing, that when COVID hit, like, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, like, I was kind of glad we had to lock our doors because that meant our children were safe because we mm-hmm. didn't fix a certain thing. And now now the public consciousness is already boiling again because it's election season, so now people have to think hard after being beat hard, after losing everything, after shutting themselves off from everyone. So we're in this huge detox period of feelings. Yeah. And so they just wag something like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard in front of us, and we're like a cat who's been wanting to play for, you know, 100 years. Like we're mm-hmm. all we're all just like because people were not psychologically ready to shut their doors but open their minds. They all closed their minds with their doors, and it just. I mean, there was a fair amount of us out there. I gotta say that stayed open minded or found out new ways to survive psychologically through it. But like, it shows. It shows in people and how much they cared more about this than anything else. Like, there's some friends of mine that I was like, "Wow, why do you even care about this? Like, you don't even do Hollywood shit." Yeah, but uh, I love Johnny Depp or. Or it was just that they liked watching the dumpster fire that was Amber Heard. But I mean, but at the end of the day, like I'm not team either, because being team mankind states that like, why do we give terrible people a platform? Why are we giving like terrible celebrities a like our idolization? You know, it's I mean, there's so many people out there that like kids could be looking up to. Like there's a planet of nearly eight and a half billion people. And you're telling me he's the best of us to the point to where we have to televise his trial and make memes about him. Look worse, too. Like it ended up in the end making him look worse because before you could have been like, oh, we don't know if it was real or not what she said. He he came out now. audio we've heard evidence of how he spoke we just learned more about them just as people and now i feel like it hurt him even more so you know going like taking her to court i'll tell you this from a hollywood fixer's perspective he just got laundered out clean she's gonna be canceled and he'll be uncanceled in about a year and a half disney will slow roll it come on it's there's he didn't lose anything yeah he now, did movies. you see the memes it's right afterwards? On stuff, like, yeah. And, but, just, like, as a person, though, he looks way worse now. <laughs> oh, as a person? Oh, yeah, absolutely. As a person, but as yeah. a celebrity, which nobody cares about him as a person because everybody just yeah. wants to be with the celebrity. So nobody, this is where he's protected, Okay, this is where his celebrity protects the fact that he's a fucked up person. Okay, she doesn't have any celebrity to protect her from being a fucked up person. That's what was on the line in this trial. The ultimate Mm -hmm. end line was who gets to be a celebrity and who is not going to be a celebrity. Okay, because even if she does come back into the industry, it's going to be some film bridge entertainment bottom of the barrel bookie like like. Son of a so and so fucking film where she's like the fifth sequel to a franchise that doesn't even have the original executive producer on it anymore, you know? Right. So, like, her life's over. Him, all he's got to do is uh, turn on some fucking carpenters and he's only just begun. Like, he's back to, man, like, people remember this. How fast did Kevin Spacey get uncanceled before we sent him back to court again? Two years. Mm-hmm. Two years. And he was already in a major motion picture. Okay, and they hot debated on whether or not they were going to take him out of the one previously, but they did. I mean, Louis C.K., he just won. uh, Yep, exactly. uh, He just got a Grammy, a comedy Grammy. All right. That's right. Two years. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, can you really get canceled? Who knows? Maybe Amber Heard isn't canceled. Maybe. No, she she is. is. She is. She is. She's she's work canceled. it show that it people might want to just see her because they're like, oh, my God, <laughs> now I really want to see her act. Because I don't even really think I've seen her act in anything besides, like, Aquaman. Aquaman. That's it, right? I mean, she's had a few things, but, like, she's not. 
Yeah, she's had things, but nobody really knew. No, she's not notable and not quotable. No, yeah. Exactly. And in a C. It was her her, you know, famousness when she wasn't really famous before anyways, you know? It was just because of Johnny Depp. Uh, you know, and that's the narrative that comes out of the trial in the end. And that's the big thing to think about on how fast he'll be uncanceled or even he's he's more yeah. like in purgatory. I don't think he ever really got canceled. He just went to purgatory. He went to purgatory. He's in the waiting area. Yeah, he's just he's, he's wa- just at waiting yeah. room like for everybody to kind of forget how shitty I am and put me in the next week. Just sit here and wait. Do you rather love another pirates movie, love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and then it'll only be a matter of time before they bring back Jack Sparrow. That's the ultimate sign. I think he'll get that mantle yeah. back one day. I really do. I, think I don't think I, I don't I think that they'll completely kick him out. I mean, look at I, Yeah, I think you're right. He'll definitely yeah. be Come back. on. D- Disney took James Gunn back after his ten year old tweet. So because mm-hmm. they, they love them some Guardians of the Galaxy and how much money James Gunn makes them. So they're going to love that Captain Jack Sparrow. Like now it's imagine like all it would take this summer, (laughs) you know, and the next thing you know, it like Captain Jack comes back for one last, last, last time, (laughs) you know, last, (laughs) yeah, last, last, last. And then they'll probably even find a couple ways of like hiding a joke. That's not really a joke that kind of like, you know, it would literally Talk be about like, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, yeah, enough about those people. I don't want to give them any more of our time. Um, they give right. me a headache, and I think that they're a distraction. Uh, but I do like distractions that are good distractions. Uh, my good distractions lately, I've uh, really only been watching Obi-Wan and then Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Uh Saw that episode three of Obi Wan. Have you caught up at all on Obi Wan, Sarah? Mm, no, I just saw the first episode. Oh wait, no, I saw the first episode of the Star Trek. I haven't seen Obi Wan. I have not seen. I haven't really been watching that much stuff lately, though. Like, yeah, I go through periods of like, oh, I got some downtime, so I'm gonna watch a bunch of stuff, and then I'll just be grinding for a few weeks and I watch shit. So yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this last this last episode of Obi Wan. Um, I'm not going to like spoil too much for those who haven't watched all of it yet because I still feel that there is a space on like uh you know how much we can spoiler talk about something until it's been out long enough. So I won't hard spoiler Obi-Wan until like the whole season is out. And that's usually my case when it's like a week to week show, you have until the the season finale to catch up. And then after that it's spoiler season. So uh spoiler free on Obi-Wan episode 3 um we, shit, I mean, okay, it's kind of a little a spoiler, but it's only because, like, people are like, when is he showing up? Darth Vader is in episode three. So, oh. if you guys are still on the fence on whether or not you want to see it, this encounter is what's going to tell you whether or not you're going to like the rest of the series, good or bad. Okay? Uh-huh. I personally think that Deborah Chow is knocking it out of the park, and she's doing a great job. Um, I'm digging what they've done with Obi Wan. How do we get to old Ben? How does he leave the Force behind? It's it like he he's barely uh, turned on a lightsaber for more than 20 seconds throughout this whole damn series, and I'm okay with that because it's like how do mm-hmm. you get to the man that was hiding in the desert that could barely train a youngling, even though he used to be some great fighter in the Clone Wars. So Obi Wan, we're checking out, guys. Um. Uh, Feel free to hit me up in the DMs and we can talk uh, hot gossip about it all season long. But no hardcore spoilers until it's out. Um, Star Trek, Strange New Worlds. I don't know. Um, I find Trekkies are hardcore up to date on this. So I'm I'm kind of late as far as it goes. So I don't mind spoiling anything I talk about Strange New Worlds because that is not one of those shows that applies on the wait till the end of the season for me. Uh, especially since it's episodic. Well, the, really, the things that I want to note about uh, how great it is right now, it's like we're getting all the best formulas that Roddenberry created back in, in the TOS days, and it's very reflective of of like of those those tropes and episodes, 
but it's it's a nice it's a nice new age take on it. Like one of the episodes I watched recently is what I like to call a submarine episode because like people don't realize that like yes, it's a sci-fi space fantasy, but what's the difference between uh on any given day, what's the difference between a U-boat, a, a German U-boat in World War II, and a spaceship in Star Trek? So um, there's uh, a lot of cool functions to that in storytelling. You get to see characters in different ways. I really have to say that Rebecca Romaine's character, it, like I, I love the whole building out of uh, the mythos of the Illyrians. So it's, it's really cool how they're bringing up all these classic characters through new characters. And then also, uh, dude, Nurse Chapel is killing it. She's now, like, in contention with uh, Chief Medical Officer Pulaski on being, like, my favorite of medical officers. But uh, she rocks. And uh, she's worth it alone. All right. Uh, enough about Star Trek because uh, today, special guest, I was lucky enough to sit down with David Chang of uh, Star Trek Fan Film Production Group, and they did this awesome short called Borg Hunters. So in my love for Star Trek and reporting on Strange New Worlds, uh, I'm going to highlight every once in a while, like, the fandom. Uh, like, we got to go down fun routes, you know, just as much as I have guests in politics. I like to have guests in music, guests in uh, books, you know, filmmaking, fan filmmaking, cosplayers, who knows? We're going to go to a lot of crazy places this summer now that the world's getting back to normal. So uh, I had a great time with David, and uh, so uh, we're going to, after we have our last little Flat Earth Dave discussion here, uh, we're going to have a great discussion about <coughs> Borg Hunters uh, and how you can watch it where on YouTube. That'll be in the show notes. Uh, talk about his film. We're going to review Strange New Worlds in Picard a little bit and Discovery. Talk about our likes and dislikes in that and what it takes to make a fan film. And then the coolest part is, is uh, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, after we've exchanged uh, fan film tapes, we're we're aiming for a collab. So uh, I will be. It's. I only took a one-year hiatus from shooting a fan film once a year. So, um, which, like, before that, I, I did five five Star Trek fan films that I shot, directed, and edited. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be putting some of those up. Uh, they're interesting. Most of those are for convention play only, so you guys got to come out. But, yeah, it'll be great. But enough about that, because we'll be taking up your time with that if you want to listen on after this. The Earth is round. I don't know why we got to keep talking about this, but you know what? We're we're prepping for this. We're getting ready. Flat Earth Dave is about a month away, and uh, kids, 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 kids. Uh, uh, a very trying statistic on my mind is that how many people believe that the Earth is flat? It's not a lot of people. I mean, it's a small percentage of the Earth, really. It's like it's. But still, still though, yeah. even a small percentage. Yeah, even be that. but just like the sheer idea that like. One in 45 people around you could very well believe the earth is flat right now. You know, I mean, it just. And then in some locales, it's higher, you know, but then like the crazy part is like it's large enough to get conventions, you know. So it's just like we, we kind of need to like. Turn around and have a conversation about that every once in a while. So today's topic come on why the earth is round. OK. Um, traveling through time zones. Okay, very simple thing. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of things refuted by Dave about time zones. But the thing is, is if you're in a high-flying plane at 35,000 feet or more, not only seeing the curvature of the Earth is very possible, but you have um, a really good view of how the sun and the Earth operate around each other. And so then at that point, you can literally watch the horizon. I'm sure as someone who's who's multicoastal in your life that you've probably crossed like five time zones in one trip sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So for those of you folks that like, you know, are, you know, really need it uh, refuted for you, I'd say save up for a save up for a circumnavigation of the globe. Take take the longest non nonstop flight you can across the world. 
You know, I, I think it's it's kind of silly how how something as simple as rotating around the sun is still refuted by some parts of society. But again, this is what comes back to the conversation of uh, a vocal minority, you know. And so we're we're covering these vocal minorities not to give them a platform of getting bigger, but we need to cover them so people are aware of what's, you know, kind of pulling down the bell curve, you know. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to do a lot of that over this summer. Uh, we're going to have a lot more special segments. Uh, and uh, hopefully as, uh, as things expand here, a lot of this uh, direct news time will get distributed into more of a, a daily dose so that way i don't have to uh i don't have to drive uh sarah wild with all all, all of this because sometimes it's like man but i just want to talk about that weird thing for the day (laughs) can we just talk about living in space but that's okay you know what yeah you know what when you come back we we can and no politics (laughs) just space but space has so much space politics. No. Oh, all right. Fair enough. All right. No all right. Politics. Okay. You can't see to do that. And every time you bring up a politic, we should actually have an episode. Where we have a drinking game. Try to get. Uh, I'm down. All right. That you know what? That's my vacation. In exchange for the fact that I'm still on the air, I'll take a break on air. I'll still record, but you'll go on your vacation, and when we come back, it's a double vacation because then I have to just. Not talk about politics, not talk about the election, not talk about yeah. things that get us down, and we're just going yeah. to cover like all the fun <laughs> stuff we want to bitch about. All right, okay, cool. This is not going to be some Johnny Depp and Amber Heard level wag here. This is going to be, yes, we do need a mental health day. All right, you know what? So, two weeks mental when you get health. back, mental health day. We've already named the episode. That's our mental health day episode. And then you know what? We're going to have, that's, I. you know what I think, I'm just going to call it right here, is you know what? You should be in charge of calling when we have a mental health day. Okay. Because I will not stop. You know I won't stop. I'll just keep, I'll just, I'll just keep covering everything in the world. I feel like you're going to slip. You're going to slip a few times. We're going to be like, ah, come here. Oh, now that's just a challenge on whether or not I can be on or not. Challenge accepted. Challenge exactly. Two, two can two can play at this. Okay. Now it's gonna be a game for me. Okay. All right. I'll get this. All right. No. You, me. Yeah. All right. You you gotta get to, you, wow. I'm gonna figure out what the hell I'm drinking because in that way it'll at least be a fair match. But yeah, no. Especially since I don't drink that often. So drink responsibly, folks. But yeah, I should warn you, I was once on a show called Drunk Punk and we got hammered for two hours and talked about everything. So Really? Yeah. I But the this- but that was also I ten years like, ago. Almost. I feel like you're gonna forget, and you're gonna steer towards politics. You're gonna get all riled up and be like, you know what? Or I <gasps> could be, or I could be talking about fairies on uh, the moons of Venus or something. You don't know. You don't know. Just for that, I'm gonna like hyperload on CBD and like hippie thoughts all week leading up to that. Yep. Nope. Yep. All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right, mental health day, and then you in charge on designating oh, yeah. future mental health days. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, yep, yeah. We should probably even get like a mental health day sponsor. That'd be a good idea. Oh my god! Yes. Anybody wants to sponsor my? Feel <laughs> 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 uh, free to get a hold of Kavika. We will be doing ad sales. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> I think that that is more than enough for today, folks. Thank you for coming on a ride this morning, and thanks for listening later in the week if you don't catch it on Sunday. We'll be back next Sunday. Uh, I'll be interviewing some more candidates this week. It is throttling down a bit as we approach the round twos. Um, I will be sending uh, at least two more emails out to everybody who hasn't responded back yet just to give them equal time leading up to the primaries. Uh, but everybody who has already responded will actually be getting a blog article about them. Those will be coming out over the next couple weeks. So since, uh, yeah, wow, it's it's already been more than a month. So, yeah, so look out on the horizon for those. I'll be sharing them on the feed. We'll be putting them in the show notes uh, and uh, hoping to have all of those candidates back on for a second time or more before we get to primaries. So, 
With that being said, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, enjoy my talk story with David and our conversation about Borg Hunters, a Star Trek film, uh, fan film, and uh, all his fun in going into that. And we dish uh, about uh, the current Star Trek series. Sarah, you have a wonderful Sunday. Yeah. Yes, you guys have a wonderful Sunday. Oh, and make sure to tune into Lifetime for Deadly Yoga Retreat that is premiering tonight at 8 p.m. And yeah. I'm in it. Yeah, dig it, dig it, dig it. You know, we need to, after it, it comes out, we need to hold, do a whole review of it. That's one of the ones that we worked on. I definitely want to rewatch because, like, I'll, I'll, I'll watch that just because I like to see how things got cut up in the final cut yeah. who disappears yeah you know or what stays longer or what was missing i mean we won't like divulge on the creative process of of the writers of the directors but we'll be like you know this seemed a little shorter in this spot or i thought it'd be longer over here or, like ooh, i'm surprised at how they tied this up you know that yep. and i have no problem dishing on jonathan bennett so let's do it he so many good things yeah, yeah no because like uh I, you know i i have to watch it like final cut before i give my review but like you know, I, on a on a, on a scale of like vibes on set, I think it's gonna be a great movie. So, I really good, really good acting team. Yaring, and I liked what I saw so far. So I'm super stoked to see it. Yeah, and I'm not even like a mm -hmm. lifetime type of person fan. So like for me to say this, that's 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 a big endorsement as far as I believe in myself because mm -hmm. I never <laughs> thought I'd see myself endorsing a lifetime movie. But look at here it I, is. Yeah. Oh. All through my twenties, it was a bottle of wine, some Five Guys, and give me some lifetime binge watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah. All right, bye, guys. Aloha, everyone. Moving forward. Right now, a future president could be running as a local candidate on your ballot. This person is vying to represent you, your family, and your community. Do you know what they are and what they stand for? Vote411.org is your tool for accurate and unbiased, up-to-the-minute election information on the candidates running in local races. Just enter your address to get started. Your vote is your power, the power to decide who represents you in 2022 and beyond. Get online, get the facts, and make your voice heard on Election Day. Moving forward. Hey, how's it? How are you? Good, 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 good. <clears throat> Down a little bit right there. Awesome. Now is the podcast a video podcast or just audio? It's just audio for the first season. We're probably not going to go video for for another season or two. Just okay. Yeah. I, I we uh we got wrangled into the concept of covering the election in Hawaii cuz there's no fair coverage. So, I had the crazy idea of interviewing every candidate and then I was like, I don't have a guy to do the video right now cuz I'm the guy that does the audio and I'm not doing extra. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things of like you know what if i don't have to wear the hat i won't which i'm probably sure we'll get into talking about that about your about your production so awesome 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 so david borg hunters man um uh, where do i start well first like let's let's just start with your with your uh with your fan production group like how did how did you guys all get together well, a few years ago, we, uh, a few of us, uh, my friends and I, got together because we were interested in making a a Star Trek fan film, and we wanted to base it on a or make it a, a story that grew out of the first Star Trek movie, the the motion picture, and so um, you know we were kind of not very experienced or anything, but we put together a, a story and a script, and we went out and we. We spent mostly one day filming it all outdoors, and then we went back uh, the following week to do a few pickup shots and, you know, a, a few corrections. 
And uh, that's how kind of how we got started just a few years ago. And so over the ensuing uh, years after that, we've continued to make some additional Star Trek fan films. Um, it was particularly challenging during the COVID time when we really couldn't get together uh, in person to film. So what we ended up doing was uh, individually filming stuff on green screen or against backgrounds. And then, uh, you know, people would do that and submit their clips and we would put them together into a story. Um, not the most exciting way to do a movie, but that's kind of what we were limited to doing at that time. Uh, I, and fun, right? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I totally uh, feel you on that sentiment of pain when it comes to doing that. Uh, I, I was actually with a group that did the at-home edition of Comic-Con, and uh, mm. I was asked to, to shoot and edit their Star Trek play. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it was crazy trying to, like, get five different locations from three different types of cell phones and then one camera and then like hoping people like understand how like a backdrop and lights work at home so then we had to you know like did, did you have any any like functional issues with that any any crazy things getting in your way and as far as like trying to layer people in and um nothing too serious as far as getting people to film themselves and to submit things mm -hmm. Uh, we did have a few green screen challenges in, in some instances where um, one of my friends who worked on the movie had to kind of do some green screen extensions or corrections in order to make it work. Um, I think the most difficult thing is just trying to coordinate it so it looks like people are talking with each other because when you're just filming yourself, um, you're just sort of pretending someone is in front of you and you're talking to them. And it doesn't quite have the same dynamic as when you are actually there with another actor or actors and you're really able to play off each other. So you're, you're trying to sort of figure out in your own head what it's supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. And so when you put it all together, uh, sometimes it works okay. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't work quite as well as you had wished but it's sort of the best you can do under the circumstances. So I think that was the more challenging thing um, as opposed to just the, the optical part of it. Right. Uh, so so I, I got to ask, uh, where where was your guys' set at that you shot on? For Borg Hunters? Yeah. Okay, so it's really interesting. There, It's a, um, a person who is a um, medical professional uh, who has his own practice and he's a big star trek fan and he remodeled his old office to look like the interior of a next generation era ship and so he's got all kinds of you know wall monitors and yeah i noticed that when i was watching it i was like but then i was like but then i was like how is that purell like hand sanitizer thing perfectly in there and red i was like <laughs> it was that a joke for it being the ss fauci or was that already there when you guys had the set so i was just like this is like meta on so many levels that like it's a doctor's office that you shot in your set that was already made at the well that, that's very observant of you to to notice that actually <laughs> but yeah i mean obviously being that it's a medical office we couldn't you know move a lot of things out of the way or at least we didn't have the time to do so either yeah. um so we just kind of left it in and you know hoped for the best and i think you know i think it still came out pretty well i, I think um, it was you know for i like i i hold fan films on a whole separate level of filmmaking because like nine times out of ten the vast majority of the crew is hobbyist filmmakers so they're really right. there more for the fandom than they are for the filmmaking. So like mm -hmm. my first thing as, as a critic of fan films is I throw aside filmmaker because like, even though as a filmmaker, I'm like, no, 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 this is, it's, it's love of the game when it comes to a fan film. And mm -hmm. it definitely shows the love of the game with you guys. Cause it's really like, I mean, the, the amount of effort that goes into it, you know, when you can see past the fact of it is a fan film, but then like, I mean, you guys had great camera gear. You guys were like, your, your lines were well put together. You know, the, the, the story had like 
a nice sequence to it. And then I got to say, that Borg outfit was pretty damn cool for, like, cosplay level fan film, man. Like, how did you guys put that together? Who made that? Uh, well, it was the actor who uh, played the Borg, um, Jerry Powell. Right on. Um, he's a cosplayer, and he's he's very good with, you know, this type of armor type of uh, costuming. So he uh, put together this Borg costume that he wears at, you know, conventions and things. And it's really, you know, very high level and very, uh, you know, you know it, it's very, it looks really great. And because he has that, I decided to incorporate him and that part of it as part of the story. Um, so we were very fortunate that we had someone like that who had already built his own board armor and was willing to wear it and to act in this movie. You know, awesome convenience is the is the key to good fan films, especially like when it's when you're calling on cosplayers, because I mean, that's that's really the majority of like how you you put the characters on there. It's like, OK, who's already got an outfit? Who likes to play the Cheryl? Who wants to be the Klingon? Who's got ridges already hiding at home? Because like, I mean, it's you know, it's a matter of budget and pieces. So it's it's really cool how to, a community comes together with all their little parts and then puts a bigger picture together. So uh, for everyone listening. Listening at home, Borg Hunters, David Chang, we're talking about fan film of Star Trek. And so the story is, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty cool. Like, you got Kim and Chakotay, like old dogs off in the universe, just like hunting down and reclaiming Borg and turning them back to human. I thought that, that was a very good procedural idea that harkened back to Voyager. You know, so you have those, you know, beyond the ongoing mission type of stuff, you know, the systemic effect of war in the galaxy. And, and this is just mm -hmm. one of those little things. I, I especially think that, like, with, you know, some of the cool stuff that we're seeing on Picard this season, like, there's a really good tie-in in there. So beyond the Borg part, what was the biggest appeal to writing a, a, uh, a Kim Chakotay story? Well, I, I wanted to uh, visit their lives, um, you know, some years after the end of Voyager. Um, so the film, as you uh, may have heard, you know, with the beginning voiceover, it's 20 years after, um, you know, then Ensign Kim started his career on the USS Voyager. So we wanted, you know, so we're picking it up now, uh, 20 years later. And, you know, I'm sure you've been around and have heard all the jokes about Ensign Kim and that he's never been promoted and that he... You know, he's still at Ensign all this time. So I wanted to kind of look at, well, let's say, let's suppose he did finally make it to captain. And now he's, you know, going to be on his first mission uh, in command of his own ship. You know, how is that going to be? What's it going to be like for him? Is he going to be confident? Is he going to be a little bit um, unsure of himself? And so I kind of wanted to illustrate that a little bit by having you know, where he has Chakotay on board because he wants to have sort of a, an older, more experienced person there with him just to kind of be a backup or be a sounding board because he's still a little unsure of himself. And I think I try to illustrate how he kind of grew a little bit in this, in this movie from, you know, lacking a little bit of self-confidence and not being quite confident and, you know, or sure of what he's doing to kind of, growing some of that confidence um and uh, learning how to stand up <clears throat> even to starfleet mm -hmm. when he got <laughs> orders to return the board um that he felt that you know there are certain convictions that he needed to stick with and that he was even willing to do that which i think is something people wouldn't have expected ensign kim to do in his younger years yeah i i heard yeah, that I, he, he definitely had a, a very, you know, it was, he was never quite totally sure of himself. But, I mean, that's kind of where they put, like, ensigns never really get to be, like, the go-hard, like, into the fire characters. Like, it was kind of like they gave him, like, middle-age Wesley vibes for a while. And it was just, you know, I, I, I felt that until he really, like, 
fleshed out in the series that he he was just a an also ran character for a while so i really appreciate especially because like there's not many like aapi characters in the star trek mythos so like right. when i saw like the advertisement for i was like all right i'm down like we're gonna go like you know <laughs> Into a place of unknown, two of the most unsung hero characters of a Voyager story. I mean, because even though Chakotay was always riding co-pilot with with Janeway, it still even seemed at times that he was dispensable to the story because it was really just this like end of the line for Janeway for a while. So I just I I that was probably the biggest thing that I, I like that caught my eye when I saw it. It was just like the weirdest thing of like a friend of a friend in like a Star Trek like Facebook group and that they hit like, and I was like, wow, okay. Borg hunters. I can do this. All right. So, <laughs> so like, yeah, I was wondering, I was kind of curious how you came upon the film, you know, of all the stuff that's out on YouTube and, and even of all the Star Trek fan films that are out there. How did you happen to come upon Borg hunters and decide to, to click on that to watch? Well, uh, I, uh, uh, a long time ago, I, I ran into a woman who happens to be, you know, a Klingon princess in, in her own right. And uh, because of her, like, going down the rabbit hole of fandom got even deeper. And so uh, ended up making friends with some Star Trek groups here and there, added my camera to help out on some fan films over time. But then as I really got to appreciate the community, like I'm a guy who likes to soak up info. So it's just any time that there's like a meme dump group or a cosplay group, I'm just like, okay, I'll add that. And then eventually like it filters into my feed and they're like, oh, oh, you might like this. And so like, I, I'd have to say that I probably don't consume a, as many fan films as I used to, but like I'm one of those kids that was lucky enough to have a parent in state government when I was a kid. So we got the first computer on the block because Uncle Sam paid for it. And like uh -huh. I was on the force.net, like back in the old dial up days, looking at fan films back when like the, the Star Wars fan film community was like in its birth phase, but like everybody else was like dropping stuff on their websites because like YouTube wasn't wholly established. So like I'd find myself watching everything from Star Wars fan films to Mega Man to Star Trek. And then that led down the great like journey of like finding more and more groups as I've gone to like Comic Con and Kamikaze and like Long Beach and all these places throughout, uh, you know, all these conventions throughout the U S so I kind of like, I just slowly collect every fan film group. And I, I love watching because I feel that like there's, there's a lot of inspiration to be found from the fans, you know, as, as a guy who, who's constantly trying to write, inspect the next great sci-fi story, like, I always try to see, like, how do fans respond to an IP? Because then it's like, well, if I'm given the responsibility one day to respect this IP and write something for it, then how do the fans respond naturally? And I, like, for me, it's what I'm the most interested is, like, what made you as a fan lead to the inspiration point to want to do a story like this. So like, I'd really like to go in and like, how did you find yourself in the fandom? Was this an early on TOS days thing or is this a later in life love and labor? Uh, you know, I became a fan of Star Trek when I was very young, like in elementary school. And, uh, well, I'm revealing my age here in a sense, but I'm, I, I, I remember watching the original series when it first came out <laughs> And, uh, and I was a fan. I was a fan of Star Trek back then. Um, and then I, you know, continued to be a fan through the years. And I've watched, uh, I've seen all the iterations of Star Trek over the years that have come out. And, um, but I wasn't, you know, I did attend some conventions when I was younger too, mostly in my area. But um, I didn't really go to any of like the really, well, when they started having the big Star Trek convention in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was when I guess things were kind of picking up, but I didn't um I didn't really attend that until I think it was 2010 when a Star Trek friend of mine, he kept inviting me to go and said, "Oh, you should go, you know." So finally, uh that year I think uh Shatner was going to be the headliner or something like that or maybe Shatner and and Picard, I don't remember. But anyway, I thought, "Oh, maybe that's a good year to go." So I, I asked another friend uh, if he wanted to go. And so we ended up going and I just really had, you know, just such a great time there. I, and then I just kept going and going. I, uh, I haven't missed any until the last one, 
which was last year, but that was due to COVID, you know, concerns about COVID. And um, so I've just been going straight. Anyway, um, so I really didn't get it. Even when I was going to the early Star Trek conventions, I wasn't really into the, like the cosplay or the costuming so much. And it wasn't until, oh, maybe I think 2007 when I went to a local one that I decided finally to dress up because I finally got something by then. Um, That's the gateway drug right there. You get a Starfleet uniform and a comm badge, and the next thing you know, you're buying a phaser. You buy a phaser, and the next thing you know, you're buying a helmet. The helmet leads to, like, but, but honey, I could totally turn this into a transporter bay. Just let me put it in the garage. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I finally got a, a, a TOS original series a tunic to wear, and then that's I, that's when I started dressing up, and then I start you know dressed up at all the uh, Star Trek conventions. So what what led to fan films is that I started becoming aware that a lot that some Star Trek um, fans were making their own Star Trek stories, dressing up and and doing things, and and I. It wasn't something I wanted to do at the beginning, but then later on, for some reason, I started to toy with the idea, and I thought, oh, you know, it might be kind of fun to do one. Maybe I'll just, you know, do a quick uh, recording on on a little camera that, I, or you know, a little snapshot type camera that I had with that has a video function. We'll just do a story, and just so I could, you know, just do one, right? And that was the beginning. That was the first one we did. And it was such a fun experience that I started thinking, oh, well, let's make another. So we did another. We didn't finish that because of COVID. But then during COVID, then we had, you know, I had some time to start making some more uh, under COVID limitations. So we made some more and, you know, uh, that kind of led to where we are now uh, with Borg Hunters being the latest one. But it's been such a fun time and I've gotten to know some more people over the years that are also very interested in fan films. Uh, I've got to meet uh, online through the internet, through the internet, a lot of folks that have been doing uh, Star Trek fan films for quite some time. And they've been really friendly uh, to us and reached out to us and actually asked us to appear in some of their films as well. And so we've gotten a chance to kind of guest star and yeah a few cross years. over into the multiverse yeah, of other yeah man so um yeah so it's been really kind of cool to get to know this community of uh, star trek fan film uh makers or film producers and to see you know the type of work that they do which is you know inspiring to me to kind of keep going and to challenge me uh, in terms of upping our quality and our stories. And uh, I, I'm just fortunate I have, a you know, a group of like-minded folks in our area that also we're all kind of on the same page and we also, and we all want to work together to just work on films and put together the best uh, product that we can, you know, with the resources that we have. And so, you know, uh, we're still going to make some more in the near future. Nice. Uh, foreseeable future. Well, I, I feel that uh, Star Trek fan films are one of the few things that's, like, keeping the, the glue of the, the fandom and even, the, like, the written universe together. I, I feel that there was times when I, when I started watching the Lower Deck series, I was like, I could have swear I saw that in a, in a fan film somewhere. There'd be like a one-liner joke, or there'd be one of the, like, watching, watching when that cartoon came out, I was like, this is literally just going to be CBS trying to do fan films as a regular show, <laughs> you know? Have you watched Lower Decks at all? I have. Yeah. I have. Yeah, it's funny. I you know I enjoy watching that. Yeah, I, I I thought it was a it was a good change of pace. But quite frankly, like I'm I'm digging the you know a lot of the new universe stuff. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on on all the new the new spinoffs, Disco and Strange New Worlds in Picard? Yeah, I enjoy watching all of them. Um, you know, I Disco you know was very different. Um, and it was the first one of the the new Star Trek series that, you know, came out. I've enjoyed watching Picard. Um, uh, I would have to say, though, just based on the first few episodes I've seen so far, that my favorite of them is Strange New Worlds. Yeah, that one, I think, 
just for me harkens back to the original series with the episodic format that they have um, where it's basically one story, one theme per episode rather than a story arc that goes over the entire season. And, you know, just being, being able to see a version of the enterprise and um, uh, Starfleet officers that are kind of similar in, in a lot of ways. Well, obviously you have Uhura mm -hmm. in there and nurse chapel and Dr. Madenga, who are all, you know, characters from the original series. But, um, you know, that the original series, I, I guess because I grew up with that, has always my been always been my favorite and probably will be my favorite. Um, so this series, because it's it harkens back to that so much, I think that I, I find that I gravitate to that series and enjoy that series more than I do you know, the other ones that have come out. Dig it, dig it. I was, uh, I was very excited when they announced Anson Mount back in the, in the disco, like when disco had first started and they were like, yeah, Pike's going to be played by Anson. I was like, wow. Like you're going to take like a heavy player like that. And the second they announced him, I was like, they're going to give him a show. They got to give him a show. They're not going to get one of the most prettiest guys in Hollywood to show up and be captain. Like, I mean, that's the only person who could probably out charm Kirk in a game would be Anson Mount <laughs> as Pike. So, I mean, which was like a really good shift for him because he had just went from Black Bolt in Marvels and Humans and Hell on Wheels. So, like, going to outer space was a huge change from, like, Wild West in comic books. So, like, yeah. I, I dig it. He's got a good cut to him. Like, he has that, that natural look that seems a little throwback to the 50s. He's already got that Mad Men type of style about him. So, you throw him in a, in a you know, throwback-looking tunic. And, I mean, you, you feel there. Like, I, I have to say that, like, it's cool to see the, the upgrades to the ship and how they make it look like, okay, this is, you know, we, we have to bend our minds a little bit because, obviously, like, it was a different time and place that we made those those sets and everything. But I feel that, like, it really it really does touch base closer to the original series. You know, I agree with you in that sense of episodic. Like, I really... I, I admire what, what Disco and uh, Picard have done to be able to, like, fill out the universe with these great large story arcs. But really what's always made Star Trek appealing is that, like, you can jump in just about any episode. You know, that was the one thing that I liked the most as a kid was just, like, we wouldn't always be able to watch it on TV. But when Gramps had turned on the TV and it's like, oh, episode 13 is playing. You don't have to know what happened in the last five minutes. We're just going right now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah in that sense it's kind of like you can like you said you can get in at any time and and not feel like you're lost whereas the um the arc type stories that uh, a lot of uh shows not just star trek but a lot of shows have these days uh that they follow um if you if you miss or if you miss like the beginning or or if you miss too many episodes you kind of get lost and you don't know what's going on and so that can kind kind of make it make it problematic. Uh, yeah, agreed. You know, and I think that that's kind of what gets in the way with some people sometimes investing. Like I have a lot of friends that don't get into the Marvel Cinematic Universe because, like, how many movies do I have to watch to understand this? Can't I just watch Thor two? No, man, you gotta watch Thor one, and then you gotta watch Captain America, and then you know. So then I feel sometimes when you're trying to get people into the new Star Treks, it's like, well. You're going to have to watch two seasons of Disco. And then if you want to un understand part of that, you might want to go back and watch this. And then, like, and if you're going to keep up, then you got to keep up every week or else you're going to have three shows to watch. And it's going to be more complicated than watching all the DCCW TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, uh, obviously it does help to have watched the previous shows because, uh, you know, a lot of the shows that they are putting on now do have references to – some of the uh, stories and aspects of the older shows. So I think it does help and it helps you appreciate uh, the current shows more if you have that, that background. But obviously for someone who's just starting out in Star Trek, you know, that's quite a formidable task to have to try to binge watch everything from their first original series and go all the way through Next Generation and Voyager, et cetera, et cetera to try to get through, uh, you know, to the present, uh, you know, unless you have all the time, you know, the world to do that sort of thing. But I, I think for most of us, we don't. 
So. No, you know, sadly, we don't have all the time in the world. But, like, I, you know, I I had some roommates way back when, and then they were like, oh, you know, I never really got into Star Trek. We should try that, you know. And then we were home for, for Christmas break during college, and then they were like, yeah, let's let's try to do it. You know, like when your friends are like, let's watch all the extended editions of Lord of the Rings. We're like, yeah, let's try to make it through every Star Trek. Let's just, like, pull up some food and, like, party through the week. And so um, – it was probably like we got through TOS and then we got about like three quarters of the way through next gen. And then they were just like, I don't know, man. And then we got <laughs> to deep space nine and they were like, okay, like, Oh, okay, this is a little bit different. I kind of, you know, cause it was more towards this, like, they liked that hard boiled sense that like yeah. being, you know, yeah. and that's why I love DS nine. Cause like not outside of like, it was, it was kind of outside of the norm. You know, you're stuck in mm -hmm. one space, the action comes to you. And then like, especially like in the earlier episodes, it was more just like, you know, who done it meets like a mystery to solve, you know, how, you know, so I liked, it, it was it was a good change of pace in that but then there's that point where like you have to convince people to go all the way through enterprise and all the way through even the hardest parts of voyager and then you're just like can we make it to the end <laughs> yeah i could be definitely information overload <laughs> yeah Absolutely. So you were saying that you were involved in some fan films yourself? I was. That's uh that's you know the funny enough that's how I met my wife. Uh she um she's with a group that has been putting on a uh Klingon stage play at Comic-Con for more than almost 30 years now. So, mm. um, yeah, the IKV stranglehold. So then when I, I, I ran into her before we started dating and I was with a group of friends that wanted to do a, uh, Dr. Who fan film. And so I helped co-write a Dr. Who fan film and then I shot it. And then half the kids in the group were like, we had fun doing this. Will you want to come and hang out with our Star Trek group? And then like time passed and like, I finally took them up on the offer and I ended up being their camera too on mm -hmm. on one of their shoots and then we later went off to do uh, i recorded a couple seasons of their shows at comic-con and then we did a mirror universe story and then um and then the last one i did with them was for uh comic-con at home and we did a, uh, you know uh, we put together five different locations eight different people you know our house was in the bubble so i shot that all with my gear and then we had a guy up in the bay area that was shooting on his iphone 6 and then a guy shooting with his tablet in lower san diego and then you know and then so then we pieced it all together and had kind of like this you know stuck on the holodeck like you know madness <laughs> thing so like and and they're a group that that was more on the edge of making up characters and going down the whole meta diatribe so i i think that's why i found it so fun was that like it was more closer to like it was like a, a proto answer to orville you know it was orville before yeah. orville you know these guys have been yeah. doing it for 30 so you know and that was that was like the most interesting thing about meeting my wife was that like when she when we, we first started talking she's like oh by the way yeah i'm a klingon on the weekend sometime and then I was like, what? And then she's like, yeah, you know, like, you know, um, you you can come and, and you can learn how to, like, you know, use a bat left if you want to. And the second she said that, I was like, I'm all, I was already in the stage fighting. I do stage combat and stuff, you know. And yeah. then, so she was just like, I've got a bat left if you want to try out. And the next thing you know, we're spending weekends clanging steel and, you know, yeah. learning how to yell at each other and cling on. Um, which then actually led to me uh, the the last the Comic Con at Home edition. I even uh, sang a Klingon opera opera parody of the Enterprise theme song in ode to everything that happened to COVID during COVID. Yeah. So. So so do you dress up as a Klingon too? I actually haven't yet. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I I've. I always ended up behind the camera. I did a couple like extra scenes just to like fill some bodies to make a shot look good. Uh, the missus has been trying to get me to buy my own ridges. Uh, you know, she's she's got a really good uh, a, like quality Star Trek two replica outfit, and um, so she tends to wear that. But she are three three 
Yeah, three. There we go. Yeah, it's more. It looks more like uh, Krug's guys. Yeah, but yeah. So um, so yeah, three. But anyways, um, so I I've I've been wanting I've been wanting to do it, but then at the same time she's been asking me like, hey, when when's the next time when we gonna do one now that COVID's over? So yeah. she's trying she's trying to get me in with the group to to actually like mm -hmm. show up on the other side of the camera. So I don't know. I'll, I'll see what I do. I I'd, I'd actually been wanting to do more parody stuff to have fun with it because like before COVID I was actually working on a uh a uh, a book of mormon parody called book of Kalis, <clears throat> and so mm -hmm. i was actually putting together a klingon mormon outfit to be a Kalis missionary <laughs> and you know the the mm. the broadway play book of mormon yeah yeah uh -huh. so we were we were shooting a essentially a music video of the 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 main song from book of mormon but as missionaries of Kalis. But like just oh, like wow. Mormons, yeah. So like I, I'm totally into the comedy side stuff, but I have been wanting to like get into like more serious fan films. It's it's kind of fun. It's a uh, to me it's it's a it's a fun break into uh, in between working on a real movie set. So it, like I find that like it's it's a good breath of fresh air to like screw around with your friends on a for fun movie set. Especially like I spend half of my year on like very straight laced like don't do that that's not your job type of movie sets. So, mm. <laughs> so yeah, when I go down to San Diego Comic Con, I always uh, I always see the people there uh, in the Klingon group, the the San Diego Klingon group. Yeah, that that's does. the stranglehold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the the one guy that I know from that group, I think he's part of that group. Uh, is a guy named Kevin Taylor. Do you yes, know him? I know Kevin. Kevin and I oh, were, yeah. 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 So I, you know, so Kevin and I are friends. I wow. see him. I see, see him there. And then um, I see him at the Star Trek convention too. Yep, Kevin goes to Las Vegas. Yep. In fact, I had talked to him a little while back about being in one of my fan films. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think in one of our future ones, um, I'm gonna be trying to get him involved in that. Playing a Klingon. Great. Oh my god, our universe just got smaller, man. That's so great. Oh man, I'm gonna have to tell my I would be like, David knows Kevin. She's like, How does he know Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> and then she'll uh, then she'll probably like stalk through your Facebook feed and go, hmm, who's in here that I know that he's hugging in in a picture? <laughs> well, you know, if, if she's a Klingon, if she does Klingon, I might want to use her. <laughs> uh, I will let her know. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> If you need a sound guy, a camera, or anybody else to work in the back or do fight coordination, you just let me know, man. I'm down to throw oh, down my sword. I always love collabing on fan films. Oh, man. The only problem is you're out in Hawaii and we're out in California. So <laughs> That is actually not much. I, I spend more money on jet fuel going back and forth than I spend on gas most days. So, like, I'm, oh, really? I'm actually – well, yeah. So um, her family's based out of California, so her dad, who runs the group, and then um, – I, What's her dad's name? Dennis. Dennis. Well, Hannon, Dennis what? Dennis Hannon. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Oh, I might have met him. I'm not sure. I'm not yeah, sure. I have to. See, I'd have to see a, a photo of him or something. I'll, I'll send you his his profile later, and and you'll check okay. it out. Yeah, I'm sure that there's there's probably tons of crossover once we find the, the right mutual friends. I'm I'm sure, but yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty yeah. So I mean, I I actually find myself back in California a lot because of work. Because like the movie industry is up and down mm -hmm. on Maui, and I don't bother with like the CBS NBC stuff in uh, Oahu because that's a whole another that's a whole another headache. So, uh -huh. um, but yeah, man, uh, I'm I'm usually out in California like half the year. So it's, wow. it's not that hard to be like, hey man, are you in town or when are you gonna be in town? Would you love to like throw down? Yeah. And I love like all like the boring stuff of making a movie happen. So like if you need something really? like coordinate shot lists, you know, day out of day sheets, stuff like that. Like I'm a production coordinator by trade. So it's a lot of my stuff yeah. is like pre-planning post, making sure that like it gets into the can and then it's edited and out and distributed type of stuff. So, yeah, well, we might just have to use you for one of our future fan films. I, so down, I, man. I was actually thinking, um, that I wanted, you know, for the Borg Hunters, uh, it was just uh, the three of us who were part of the crew that were 
kind of trading off, you know, shooting and all that stuff. Although one of the guys was, uh, the guy who played the doctor was the main director, um, really. But he, uh, but, you know, for the most part, we didn't have like a, an actual camera person. It would be mostly him shooting, or if he was in the scene, someone else would shoot. And that's just how we did it. <laughs> that's how a lot of fan films do it, man. Yeah. And I mean, that's, because really like, most of the people together it's it's i tend to find that fan films are like actors and writers and then the rest of it figures itself out because then somebody goes oh i got a digital slr at home i'm not using and then another person goes oh well my camera's kind of the same quality so now we got two cameras and then the next thing you know it's somebody goes all right i'll i'll buy a boom let's let yeah let's get legit and put a boom on on these things and now we got all speeding here we go you know yeah <laughs> So yeah, no, it would be a it would be a luxury for us to have an actual like uh, director, camera person, director of photography who wasn't actually in the movie too, I who would could be just honored. who could just deal with the, you know, doing that part of the that the production and not have to wear so many hats, you know. But yeah, we could talk some more about that later, you know. Maybe, Absolutely. Uh... <laughs> so. Um... We got a little bit more time here left before we go. Um, would you like to give any shout outs to your team and all the people that helped put this together? Oh gosh, you know, uh, the main guys that are I'm really glad to be, you know, helping out in this and, and just collaborating with, you know, uh, my buddy, uh, Mark Lum, who played, uh, you know, Dr. Tam in Borg Hunters and he's, played Admiral Chong and uh, other productions we've done. And he's our, uh, he's been lately our, our main director, director of photography and uh, an editor. And then uh, Mike Longo, another bud of mine, who's uh, been really helpful, not only being playing um, Admiral or Captain Kirk in all the productions, also playing Chakotay in Borg Hunters. Uh, he's got, he has a film camera background too, and he's been really helpful with just a lot of the technical aspects of the film and uh, doing some editing, doing color correction, making a lot of suggestions about lighting, all kinds of stuff that, wow, you know, when I first asked him to join, I just was wanting him to, to play Cap, you know, Admiral Kirk. And um, I never knew that he had all that background and <laughs> that was, you know, turned out to be so, so helpful to us. And then um, another guy, Ken Hayashida, who is our uh, Captain Sulu, plays Captain Sulu. But he's also helped a lot with a lot of behind the scenes stuff and uh, special effects stuff, too. Um, things that... Uh, I wasn't aware that he had any interest in that area and had talent in that area. So he's been very helpful. Uh, Wayne Harding has done a lot of our uh, special effects. He's been a great help and has done a lot of the modeling for ships and things. Um, let me see. I mean, there's just so many other people who just helped in one way or the other. Vince Glazer the third did a lot of special effects for Borg Hunters. We did like the transporter scene and the uh, uh the the uh, phaser fire and all that sort of thing all kinds of stuff which just made <laughs> made the, the film so much more fun and and realistic looking i guess to the extent that you know you can make it look realistic um yeah so you know people like that i hope i haven't forgotten anyone but those are like the main people who have been just really a part of the uh the film the films that we've been doing Right. Um, so, uh, what's on the horizon for uh, your your group? Uh, what's what's your next exciting adventure? A anything anything in in the mind? Uh, has has the writers' room already started percolating on the next great adventure? Yeah, our friend, uh, my friend Ken, is working writing a script uh, that's going to be kind of a well. What I can say about it is it's going to be a crossover uh, with our you know film production company not really company group, uh, with a couple of other Star Trek fan uh, film groups. And so it's going to be a, a crossover where we're going to incorporate characters from each of our different universes into a single film. And so that would be a, a lot of fun. 
I think for us to be able to work with them and to just kind of combine the different Star Trek worlds, fan film worlds together. So that that's something that's being worked on. Uh, that may or may not be our next film that we shoot. Just depends on when the script's ready and when we can get everything together. I do have already uh, a story for the next Borg Hunters film. Right on. Um, yeah, so that's something that I hope we'll, we will be able to do sometime in the near future. And then I, I mentioned that there was one that we shot, um, I guess, a few years ago that we haven't been able to finish because of uh, COVID and stuff. So we have plans to try to finish that film finally. It was started back in 20. 20- 19 i think 2019 we we started shooting it and we haven't been able to finish it so i hope that we can finish shooting it and that we can get it all edited and and out finally either by end of the year or or sometime early next year so we've got a number of different things uh that are kind of uh on on the plate as well as other kind of ideas sort of in the back burner other stories in the back burner for future use or future um production so i think we'll be busy for the next few years <laughs> right <on. laughs> <Not really>. <laughs> well definitely give me a call when you want when you want to wreck it and collaborate because i am down i will i will i'll be like i'm getting on a plane you just tell me where to land um <laughs> Well, we'll try to coordinate it with your time out here. Absolutely. So you well, the missus and I are, are, are trying to plan to shoot another one with the group out in California in, yeah. in uh, closer to the end of the year after my regular production. Like when we're, when work production's over, then we're, we're, we're trying to work on something fun to, uh, oh. to go on a, on a very, like we're trying to get back into it regularly. So we're trying to figure out something we could put a small group together. Um, She's tasked me with the uh, the endeavor of trying to write something in a post burn universe to match with like mm-hmm. after disco, you know, far far future disco. So I uh, I've always had dreams of figuring out how to uh, escape from Repente. So I think that's on the uh, on the list. I just I just watched a film that was made by one of uh, my fellow uh, Star Trek fan film makers. Uh, that takes place in the post burn universe. Oh wow! Oh, yeah, it's called, it's called. I believe it's called Broken Road. All right, Broken Road Star Trek fan production, and so he just released it this past Sunday. So I think if you, I think it would be easy to find. Dig it. But he's like, he's like the most prolific guy out there. He's got over a hundred fan fil- Star Trek fan films under his belt over the last. I don't know, like eight years or something. So he's like, he's like the Roger Corman of Star Trek fan films, you know. Dig it, <laughs> dig it. There's got to be one in every group. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So yeah, set. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see uh, photos of your wife dressed up as a Klingon too. Absolutely, I'll I'll send you some photos. We'll we'll start swapping films and 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 uh, ideas. I'll send you I'll send you some links to the to the last couple uh, ones that uh, I shot with the team, so you could see. Uh, oh yeah, you know, how we put them together. But yeah, we'll we'll start trading tapes, brother. Love it, and and I love I love you know what you guys brought to the table. You know, it's it's very a. I, I feel that, like, especially on the growing up as a kid around it, it can be kind of an inspiring thing to be around other creative people who just let loose and have fun with something as, you know, unifying as Star Trek because it's, it's a good common ground. Every Everybody mm-hmm. can agree on some level. They, they may not be able to agree on who their favorite captain is, but they can all agree on some level that it's, right. it, you know, it's – it, it's it's a great story it's a great universe and and it really does bring people together so like i i'm honored for you coming today man mahalo for for making the time and i definitely want to talk to you more and maybe even you know get your thoughts on on some of this new star trek stuff in future segments and and get updates on your uh on uh, your cruise mission so thank you, David, for coming today. Oh, definitely. Thank you for having me on board on this. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be able to, to talk to you and to, you know, hopefully have some fun stuff for your uh, audience to listen to and Absolutely. to inspire them. Yeah, right. man. Dig it. Dig it. Well, 
Uh, you enjoy the rest of your day, sir. It has been a pleasure, and I will definitely be talking to you more. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too, man. Aloha. Aloha. <gasps> Rabbit Holes is a Manava Cow production. This episode was produced by Kadika Hoke and Sarah Rodriguez. Make sure to subscribe and follow on your favorite podcast platforms to add our weekly episodes to your queue.